Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 25th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's week in charts, we're going to talk about current market conditions, obviously, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, as I say each week, for those of you who knew, though, just so you'll know, you can ask about as many stocks as you want, but two things. One, wait until we get to the charts. And number two, ask about a stock and hit return so I can get to all of your picks. This week, this week he tried to say, we're going to talk about mentality versus methodology. And the Week in Charts is brought to you by me. And right now I have a special on the stock selection course. If you get the stock selection course, then I'll give you an entire year to my service. Now, I don't want to be vain or anything, but I would think after a year, provided that you worked hard, and we're going to talk a lot about you in this episode. That's why I'm emphasizing you. But if you studied the course on how to pick stocks and then you followed along for a year, I think after a year you'd be very happy with the outcome. And that's why I'm giving the course – away I'm sorry that's why I'm giving a year away free to the service with the course so you can get up to speed learn the theory but then see it in practice and that's important because as you know in theory theory and practice are the same in practice they are not now I know you might be broke or cheap I'm half kidding uh, or just quite frankly burnt in the past and if you have been then take your time and study all the stuff on my website and I've got hours and hours and hours and hours of stuff somebody told me recently I'm giving away too much well that's okay I want to get everybody up to speed as as much as possible so study stuff on my website and if you do want to do something you could support me by when you see a banner ad like this support me by clicking on this and getting the um, what's offered in this case it's free it's an ebook it's uh, has an article by me and seven other traders so it, it won't cost you anything. So please support the website by that if, um, if you're not going to get uh, products, okay? And that's what keeps everything up and running. Uh, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. And as I like to s sum it up, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. As I've been saying lately, and then my summer project has been to work on a beginner's course, and, and as usual, I kind of underestimate the project. That's, that's typical of me. I don't know if it's overconfidence or what, but in this particular case, I thought it'd take me a couple of weeks to bang it all out. I've got most of the material already out there anyway, all the material. And what I quickly realized was it's a lot more involved than I thought it would be. And one of the things I began to think about is, okay, well, to make this – really good how how should i approach this project how should i think about it and the thing i thought about is if i could go back 30 years in time what would i tell that young punk version of me by the way i didn't have a young picture of me on the internet i'm sorry i didn't have a young picture of me on my computer so i googled me and i found this uh, atrocity out there this is actually from a counterfeiter who is counterfeiting some dave landry stuff i guess i'm flattered that i'm known well enough to be counterfeited especially uh 20 years ago so anyway that's kind of uh that's kind of interesting so maybe they'll sue me for uh for um copyright infringement that'd be great so i can get their address um so what would i tell that young version of me would it be trends pullback stock picking and i say yeah of course but above all of the above more importantly how to think how to think about markets and how to think about yourself. So it's mentality over methodology. And as I said a few weeks back or a couple of months back, whenever I first started talking about doing this course, I was looking for a definition of, of what I was going for with this mentality thing. And I found it on vocabulary.com. It's a habitual or characteristic mental attitude that determines how you will interpret, and I think more importantly, respond to situations. So as you could probably tell, mentality is going to win over methodology. 
But before we get to that, what would I tell that young punk version of me? Well, first thing is, it's going to be a lot harder than it looks. And on paper, trading looks pretty easy. You just look at your screens, and you have these little blips on your screen. And all you have to do, like my wife, okay, all you have to do is trend the hedges and then blow a weekend ripping out shrubs. You know? All you have to do is just fix this little leak, and then next thing you know, we got the whole wall turned, torn apart, and we're pulling pipes out the wall. You know, All you have to do. Well, like plumbing and, and landscaping, it always looks a lot easier on the surface than it really is. All you have to do, like in my case as a trend follower, is just buy on the pullbacks. That's it. So it's going to be a lot harder than it looks. The market will often fake you out and shake you out. Two of my favorite adages on that are markets will often do the most obvious thing but in an unobvious, this should be an, I guess, but in an unobvious manner, and a market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most participants. Now, that seems a little esoteric, but on this, but it's really not that difficult. And I borrowed that from Linda Rasky, and I uh, saw her at one of the AAPTA meetings, and I asked her um, where she got that from, or, or I, I told her I was quoting her on that, and she said, well, I don't remember developing that, but it's probably something that I got off the floor. She called it a florism, and she said, you learned a lot of good things on the floor. Uh, there's not many floors left, but as Linda said and others have said prior to her, the way you get successful on the floor is you just walk around and, and you find somebody who seems to be successful, and if they're there a month from now, two months from now, three months from now, then just hang out with them. And if they're not, find someone who's been there for several months. But anyway, I digress. And a corollary to the thing about the markets doing what they have to do to frustrate the most, and then the most obvious and the unobvious manner, is what Covell once said. He said, trend following, and I'm paraphrasing, is like riding a bucking bronco. And it's kind of interesting. I think in his first edition of his trend following book, he hadn't thought about that, and then later editions, he actually put the Bronco on the front cover. But Michael's right. It, it, it does uh, really equate to riding a bouncing Bronco, trying to hold on to those trends. And uh, for instance, this morning, I was going to wait and share this later, but it's like we got stopped out of one by a little bit, and it's like the market is just like shaking us out, and then what happened next? It turned right back around. So that's typical of a market to do that to you. And if you're just looking at the chart in hindsight, it looks pretty easy. It looks, oh, just get on and stay on. But you don't realize how many little whipsaws are in between. Now, the other thing I would say is it's not nearly going to be as hard as you try to make it. Now, wait a minute. I just said it, it's, 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 it's harder than it looks, and now I'm saying it's not that hard. What am I saying? Well, I never said it was easy, but it's never going to be – it's not near – I'm sorry. I never said trading was easy, but it's not nearly as hard as most people make try to make it. So I would tell that young Pung version of me, when you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator, a third-order derivative, and it, boy, did I do a lot of that early on, I would, I would make a – an indicator, which was derivative price, and then it made derivatives derivatives. And part of that was because I read people who did that. They had literally, they would take all these oscillators, combine them together, and they'd do derivatives of derivatives on them, and they thought they had some sort of holy grail. And I thought they did, but in reality, they did not. They were just simply selling an indicator to make money. There's nothing wrong with that if it actually works, but if you just if you don't actually use it, and, it, and it's not and you're not successful with it, then uh, it's a little disingenuous to actually sell it. But I digress. So in other things I've done is like counting price bars or trying to determine if it's a if it's a fifth of a third or a third of a fifth. So whenever I find myself doing that, or when well, okay, going back, uh, Big Dave, Little Dave, I guess Little Dave, but a little young Dave. So when you find yourself doing those type of things, just stop and ask yourself. Is the market 
And that market could be anything. It could be a stock, the overall market itself, a sector, a commodity, a forex. Is it generally heading higher? Is it generally heading lower? Or is it just going sideways? And that's the only three states that a market can exist. So keep it simple with that in mind. As I often say, if you can't explain to me a trading system on a cocktail napkin or to anyone else for that matter, then toss it out. Along those lines, there is no holy grail. My wife was in a hurry this morning, so she didn't ask me, but usually she's like, what are you going to talk about today? Not the holy grail, huh? I'm like, ah, because <laughs> it often comes up. But I think it's important to know that there is no holy grail. And now this is kind of a, a bit of a dilemma in telling you this, or especially you guys knew it, I should say, because early in my career, I searched for it, and all that searching created me, okay? It's like all that stuff you do, just like any other thing in your life, both good and bad, it makes you who you are. And you have to embrace all that. So it's like, it's almost like you need to go out and search for it. And then when you don't find it, realize that it wasn't there to begin with. So the fact that there is no Holy Grail is actually a good thing. It means that no one knows. And I'm getting a little further ahead of myself. But let's say you are in that grail hunt and you developed a system that just absolutely prints money. Congratulations. Then you have you have what you've done is you have successfully curve fit the past. You have found out what the market did historically, and your system fits perfectly to that. In other words, you've curve fit that. Unfortunately, the curve will be much different in the future, guaranteed. As I've said before. I was talking with a system seller once. I say seller because I don't think he was actually trading his systems. And I told him that his biggest drawdown was always in front of him with a mechanical system. And he got mad at me. And that made me realize that he didn't realize how it works. What's your name, Beatrice? That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. So if you do find something that you really think is the holy grail, then make sure you forward test that too. Because I guarantee you the future will be different. And and here's the thing. It might be different in such a subtle way that would seem completely insignificant. But you could be a penny off or a few cents off. And that can mean the difference of the system working and not working. Now, that's why I'm a discretionary trader because we could use our minds to adjust. And it's not like a big, huge adjustment. Okay, it's not like you go from trend following one day to mean reverse the next day to some sort of uh, arcane system the next day or whatever. All you're doing is just making small adjustments. For instance, in more recent times, I've given entries a little bit more wiggle room, and that's avoided a lot of losing trades. Whereas if you were, if you had a system that had fixed entries, then you would have caught a lot more losing trades. So the point is, the future will be different. Now. Like the Holy Grail, it's nearly impossible for me to do a presentation without saying quite a few things that I always do without beating a dead horse. But it's true. No one knows exactly where our market is headed. Not you, not me, and not the guy who screams on TV. And that was tough for me early on. I felt like someone had the answer. And... I can tell you flat out, no one does. I have a lot of my clients that, that I'm, I'm humbled by because they're just as good or better than I am, okay? In some cases, better. But they know I'm out there doing the work, and they know I'm out there grinding it out, and that's why they have me on their staff. But the bottom line is no one knows exactly where a market is headed, and no one has any secret information. And the people who have made a lot of money – longer term have just simply done very simple things like followed along and have not tried to outsmart the market and that's why they're consistent they work hard to catch those trends now the fact that no one knows is again it's quite 
liberating. And that takes the pressure off. And I had put tremendous amount of pressure on myself early on to try to figure out every zig and zag. So don't beat yourself up. Now, one thing what's kind of cool is, in fact, in some cases, being a little guy actually might even give you more advantages. I have some RIAs on my service, Registered Investment Advisors. And every now and then I'll get an email from one or two of them. And they'll say, hey, Dave, uh, that IPO trade was pretty cool, but I couldn't take it because it, it was just too thin for my clients. But I took it personally. You know, so you might not be able to do things as a big bad, big money manager. You think, oh, those big guys have some big advantage over me. But the reality is, unless you're talking about something like high frequency trading, and that's a whole other ball of wax, and that's a whole other, uh, that's a whole other conversation. But as a general statement, your average trader, your average RIA, your average money manager, whoever, however you want to look at it, they really don't have any advantage over you. And again, in some cases, being small and nimble, you have some advantages. I guess I should have put, I was kind of looking for like a David and Goliath uh, graphic, but I thought this one was kind of funny. But you really do have little advantages because you could trade those thinner stocks and take those more volatile stocks within reason. It's like I've been in presentations before where I show these great setups, these great momentum setups, presenting to some of these, these groups filled with money managers and a guy will say, well, I can't, I can't buy a stock that volatile for my client. Well, and like I've said before, well, then you don't get no Coke. Okay. Like the line in Caddyshack. I ain't paying no 50 cents for no Coke. Well, then you ain't getting no Coke. So the little guy does have advantages in some particular cases because that person on the institutional side in certain cases, might have to justify why he's buying this volatile stock. And if the stock is continues to be volatile, as we hope it will be, and more importantly, hope it moves in our favor, but if that stock does not work out, which often it doesn't, then he's got to explain even further why he bought that volatile stock. So he might not be under different constraints than you. You're free to do what you want, okay? So again, since no one knows exactly where the market is headed, and, and before I go any further, if you think about it, as, as Tom McClellan once said, when you make a trade, you're forming a relationship between you and everyone who bought that stock before you, and it could be any other instrument. But And those people screw you. And people sell, as I say, often say for a variety of reasons. It is Tom McClellan's mother once said, Marion McClellan once said, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use for more sophisticated methods. So there is no holy grail because you don't know what all these people are going to do. Okay. What are you going to have for lunch today? Write it down right now. Okay. And then next week, I'm going to ask you what you had for lunch. And I bet in a lot of cases, a lot of you had something completely different than what you said you would do. So what? How do, if you can't even decide for a, a fact what you're going to have for lunch today, or if you don't know what you're going to have for lunch today, how do you know what you're going to do in the markets? Okay, my point is that people's minds change, things change, and then in the markets, people get divorced, people buy houses, people have kids go to school, Junior didn't get the scholarship, you thought he would, okay? So things happen. So because you cannot control the markets and you can only follow along, keep it simple. I've been in quite a few presentations and I don't wanna, I gotta be careful, I don't wanna call anybody out or either while I'm there or um, in general. But they'll put up stock charts that look a lot like this. And they'll have dozens and dozens and dozens of buy and sell signals. And it might be a pretty impressive system. But by the time you add up all that slippage and all that commission, there's the potential that you have an anthill system. In other words, something that makes tiny, tiny bits of money and loses a lot more every now and then on occasion. 
And usually they'll have a moving average plotted on the screen. And what's amazing is if you just kind of use your mind's eye and look at that moving average, or as I have pointed out here, you'll see something as simple as just staying with the trade as long as it stays above the moving average, it doesn't close above the moving average, can help keep you in the trade. It can also be a signal in and of itself. And in this particular case, we had a bow tie, a little bit more complex type of thing, but we also had what's called a first thrust, a big thrust from lows and a pullback. So by getting into or by following a simpler system, your life's going to be a lot easier. This is a lot easier than that, okay? So, again, it's not nearly as complex as people try to make it, but everyone thinks they have to figure it out and that it should look like this. And, you know, the industry is uh, on the institutional side is really bad about that. The hot thing right now is all of this mechanical, mechanical quantitative stuff, okay? And... I started writing a book, and that's probably at some point going to be um, – actually, was, it was, it's what I went into. It's what I did with the stock picking course. Uh, but at some point, it might be a book, and I had a major publisher um, approach me, and uh, they said, okay, well, what do you have? And I said, oh, I've got this book I've been working on, The Lost Art of Stock Selection, which is actually the stock picking course. And – I said, it's become a dying breed, and, and they looked at the material I sent them, and they said, well, yeah, Dave, you're right. It has become a dying breed, and we're not interested in that because we're interested in something that's going to be much more popular, okay? So if I probably wrote about quantitative systems or something, then, then all of a sudden that book would have gotten published. So I got turned down by this publisher who was, who was um, recommended by a, a friend of mine. To me, I mean, they called me. It wasn't. It wasn't. I was. I wasn't soliciting a publisher. They actually found me because they were looking for content. But anyway, I digress too far. But had I showed them something more complex, they probably would have been all over it, other than just good old-fashioned stock picking. So keep it simple, okay? Now, getting back to that young punk version of me. I would tell him the battle will often be within. Now, as I said before, I've had a couple of situations where I've helped some kids become successful in, in their stock picking contest, just wildly successful and knock the cover off the ball in their projects, in their school projects. So is it me? Can I brag about that? No, it's them because they're just following the system. And the way they're following the system is they're just following the system. They're not worried about their children, which I don't have, obviously, who are hungry or making a mortgage payment or are looking smart or whatever. They just want to get out of the class and move on. OK. And they're instantly successful. It's like it takes most people about 10 years. Well, they could do it in 10 minutes. And it's because they don't have the emotional baggage attached to every trade. Now, along those lines, being right and making money are two different things. And little Dave, you will become a trend following moron. Embrace this sooner rather and later follows a key word of trend following. And that's, that's one of the big things that I've gotten out of that and quite a few other little things that I'm going to show you here, but out of being a member of the American association of professional technical analysts, it's not so much the, the, the technical analysis stuff and like gee whiz and wow, that's great. It's more of like just the common sense things that come up, like follow is a key word of trend following. So as a trend follower, you're not going to be smart, and you're not going to look smart, I should say. And that's how I got the name Trend Following Moron, because someone was short a huge position, and I was on the Internet. Uh, I was way back at the trading markets.com days, and I was on the Internet saying, 
hey, this looks like it's going up. And I was drawing big blue arrows on the chart. Finally, I got pissed off. They got pissed off and shot me an email, a nasty gram. And they, it got even uglier from there. But usually I just say, ah, kiss your mother with that mouth, you know. I do tend to antagonize people back. <laughs> now, as a trade follower, again, you're not going to look smart. You're going to be a little late to the game. And you're also going to be a little late to leave, okay? You'll find that trend following done properly in the end, as I'm going to repeat here in just a second, but it will end badly, and you will overstay your welcome. But you just have to follow along until you're completely convinced that the trend has ended, when that correction becomes a lot more than a correction. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, too. Uh, Greg was visiting over uh, last Christmas. He stopped by, and we had a few beers, and we got talking about market signals and stuff. And he often says, I take, um, you know, you should take or whatever. You, you have to take market signals seriously. The reason is because whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. Okay, so you're going to get whipsawed occasionally as a trend follower. Watch the Whipsaw song by Ed Sakota. It's quite amusing. He actually spoke to our group and uh, brought his little banjo and uh, <laughs> and played the song. And we, uh, we sung along with him. It was kind of fun. So, but Whipsaws are, they're like death and taxes. You're not going to avoid them. But you could survive a Whipsaw, okay? It's just frustrating. You can't survive a bear market or a huge adverse move. Now, again, I know I beat the dead horse a lot. It, it drives my wife crazy, which I'm not stupid enough to make the short trip joke, of course. But I do beat a dead horse a lot around the house or whatever. But as I often say, and this is what I would tell little Dave, I'll let you in on an ancient hedge fund secret. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So with the go, you're going to need the woe, okay? Money management is going to be important. But when you first think about trading, you're, you're thinking about trends, momentum, trends, 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 trends. And sometimes you forget about the woe. And that's a saying in the hot rod community. When you put in the go, if you put a big engine in something, and I've got a couple projects around the house, I'm doing that <laughs> exact thing with, uh, you're going to need the woe, okay? You're going to need the brakes. And the first time I went around an actual racing track, uh, I learned that really quickly. Uh, Peter Moffey took me on a ride uh, on the track in Dallas. And one thing that really surprised me, and there were a lot of big, fast cars there, but one thing that really surprised me, we actually were pretty nimble and were taking on some of these, these much faster and heavier cars. But what shocked me about it was it's like the brakes were just as important as going fast. So with the go, you're going to need to whoa. And with good brakes, you could you could get to, you could you have to get to the corners fast, but then you have to get around the corners. So that good brake is important to slow you down. So just like brakes are important in auto racing, being able to stop having those stops in place is also important in trading. Now, as I often say, and again, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse in all this, is it's going to end badly. Every trade is going in badly. And without going into too many details, because I've done it quite before, see my archives of these shows on, on my YouTube channel or my website under videos, you're either going to get stopped out of the loss or either full loss or partial loss. You're either going to make a little on a swing trade and then give up the rest of it and scratch out, or you're going to get a swing trade, capture a longer-term trend, but in the end you're going to give up a substantial port portion of those gains as a trend follower, okay? What, what first looks like a correction turns out to be something much more, and you will have to give up some of those open gains. And again, don't try to outsmart the market by saying, oh, I'm up 50%, that's plenty, because that's a trade that might go 100, 200, or 1,000%, and if you quit at 50%, you'll never get to 1,000%. So 
every trade is going to get badly, you need to ask yourself, what is your plan for when it does? Now, when it does end badly, drop an F-bomb, okay? But then shout next. So have that stop in place. Get stopped out. Cuss and fuss. I dropped an F-bomb right before this presentation. I'm still human. Just because you decide you're going to become a traitor doesn't mean you're not still human. Okay, you still have emotions. You still have a pulse. In fact, without emotions, you can't make a trade anyway. How many times have I talked about that? So be able to shout, shout next. Um, I often tell a story from the late, great Mark Douglas. I have one of his cassette tapes here. You, you whippersnappers in here. I never thought I'd be old enough to say whippersnapper. But uh, you whippersnappers in here probably don't know, even know what that is. It's just little, it's actual tape. And it's got like little wheels. And then you plug it into a thing. You know, anyway, I have one of his tapes. And in the, on the tape, he says, he talks about a good salesman versus a bad salesman. A bad salesman makes a few bad sales calls in a row. And then he gets frustrated and goes, drinks his lunch. A good salesman makes a few bad calls in a row, sales calls in a row. Gets not frustrated. He goes get a cup of coffee. And then he goes back to the phones because he knows that he's getting closer and closer to making a sale. So with trading, provided you're doing everything properly, if you hit a, if you hit a little bit of a losing streak, that's okay because you're getting closer and closer to a winning streak. It comes to the territory. So when I got started, I really thought it was going to be methodology and then money management. Uh, quickly learned was important too, and then this mind thing. But the reality is it's mentality first, then the money management, and then the methodology also often comes last. But everyone is a setup junkie, and we're going to talk about some stuff here today, obviously. But it's mentality over methodology. The greatest system in the world, the greatest methodology in the world is useless if you don't have the mindset to follow it. Okay, we've got a couple announcements, and then we have a um, – I had a writing question last minute, and then also we have uh, some uh, questions coming in. So, again, uh, I'd be willing to bet that a year from now you'll thank me, but, again, it'll be you and not the grand poobah. So check out that stock selection course, Money Back Guarantee, uh, on the course, so you can um, check that out, and you get a year's free to the service on that. And I truly think that a year from now, provided you're willing to work, okay, and that's why I say it's it's going to be you and not the grand poobah. I'm going to lay the framework for you and build that foundation, and I'm going to put you in the hunt on these things, but the reality is it's going to be you. And the reason I'm saying that is because I have I have clients that are wildly successful and I have clients that couldn't hit the side of the barn to save their lives. And both of these clients are getting the same exact information. OK. Anyway, enough on that. So, uh, as you know, I'm working on that beginner's course and um, I'm going to put out quite a bit of it uh, as a as a free multi port base. So keep an eye out for that. I got a lot of free stuff, obviously, on my website. Uh, the website's been under redesign for a while. I guess that's like an ongoing thing. It's always going to be under redesign. But if there's anything you'd like to see or think you could do better, let me know. Um, I have plenty of programmers, so don't uh, no need to call me on that uh, if you're a programmer. Okay, this is a write-in. I've been trailing my stop higher on GDX and was within 50 cents of being taken out yesterday. I've been looking to add another precious metal position. This looks like a TKO in several of the mining stocks, but sometimes – it's difficult to differentiate between a longish pullback ending in a TKO and a first thrust down. I guess if this turns out to be a first thrust down, correctly placed, buys will never trigger. Well, ironically, uh, and I guess Jim's in tune with what's going on in the overall market, but let me just show you what I initially thought I would talk about today. You know me. It's like I'm, over the past several years, it's like I always think I'm going to talk about methodology, and by the time I get to my slides, I end up talking about, trading psychology and mentality 
But what I woke up thinking about this morning, I said, like, well, I'll just cover this when I get to the charts. The great thing about a deep pullback is it's either the end of the trend, provided you're not already in. Okay, let's assume you're not in this market. And you got a nice thrust higher of some nice big magnitude. And then you got a deep pullback in there. The great thing about that is, is if that market, it might be better off drawing it. Let me draw it with um, bars. If you go in and watch the TKO presentation I did a few weeks ago, and then I think we talked about meat a few days ago, or last week, M-E-E-T. The great thing about a big wide range bar down or a TKO bar like this or something is that if the market comes all the way back up and triggers, okay, then you have you might have a bona fide resumption of the trend. So along the lines of a deep pullback, which I initially was talking about, if you get a trigger in here, then it's possible this market has recovered and you get two things. You get the reversion to the mean move, okay, and you get the longer term trend resumption. And that's the best of both worlds, as I often talk about. And if you want, um, check out my best of both worlds article or re report on the website. It's in the store. Uh, if you scroll, I make you walk through the gift shop to get to, to the uh, free stuff. So scroll through the store. It's on the bottom. And uh, it's called the best of both worlds. Best of both worlds. I call it Bob W. for short. So read that article if you're not familiar with the methodology. And then watch the 1,700 YouTubes I have out there. and Read the 600 columns I've put out. Anyway, the beauty of a deep pullback is, as I often say when talking about transitions, it's either it's at an inflection point. So... It's either going to be the mother of all tops or it's going to reverse. It'd be the mother of all reversals back in the direction of the trend. So this was just a massive correction. You don't know at the time, and that's why I put in question marks. And the beauty is, like I showed last week or week before with uh, Meet, M-E-E-T, we had this big knockout move and it had an entry up here. So for this stock to come all the way back up here, it would be the mother of all reversals. But what happened? It did not. It continued to implode. So we missed a losing trade. So this is a really beautiful place to be. And that's the problem I've had with gold and silver. Admittedly, I've been having a hard time getting on board gold and silver this year because it's been very wide and loose and it really hasn't adhered to the methodology that well. And again, as I often say, there's no holy grail. So this is necessarily a be all end all. It's the best thing I've found after many years of searching. But it's not going to catch every move all the time, guaranteed. It'll catch a lot of them, and it'll catch enough of them. Okay, enough is a key word in that sentence. But I thought about this coming in today as I talk a lot about deep pullback. So when we get to the charts, I'll talk about it a little bit more, and it'll make a little bit more sense. But these metals and mining stocks, especially the gold and silver, were at really nice trends, and then they just got whacked yesterday. So that's going to either be the mother of all reversals, and the stocks are headed lower, or, as I'm going to show you in a minute, by taking a look at like a weekly chart, it might just be a knockout move, okay? Okay, Donald says, I do like quantitative. Quantitative or qualitative? My eyes are hurt. Or quantitative mechanical systems. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but what's interesting is, as I've said before, my friends who – claim to be mechanical, I think they're a lot more discretionary traders than they than they let on to be. And then a lot of those same friends think that I'm a lot more mechanical than, than I say. So if you kind of look at how I execute, okay, here's a pullback, and I quantified it by these parameters, and let's get on here, put a stop here, take partial profits here, trail a stop, and let that stop widening out. I suppose you can kind of quantify that down. Years ago, there was a, I don't know if he was using artificial intelligence or something, but it, it actually made me a little nervous. Now, I no longer worry about such things, but he was actually had a company that was, that was programming systems, but not so much from a, um, from a mechanical standpoint, but from this kind of a, artificial intelligence standpoint and he actually had a staff i don't know how he's doing now i'll have to look him up and see 
but they would actually they were actually kind of tweaking things as they as they went along and it kind of scared him because he was kind of i think he was on the cusp of mechanizing what's going on in my brain <laughs> you know uh to where it was a little bit more he had it kind of figured out a little bit but probably not and i'm kind of digressing too far on this but the point i'm trying to make is you have to execute in almost a mechanical manner, but it's very dangerous to follow a mechanical system or follow. OK, so maybe follow your system mechanically, but don't follow a mechanical system. I kind of went off on a, on a tangent on that one. Huh? Imagine that. David says, in your service, do you hold many stocks through earnings? I hold all stocks through earnings. OK, now. Occasionally, you will get whacked. As a general statement, and this is a general statement, surprises generally happen in the direction of the trend. Not all the time. You're going to occasionally get whacked. But if you go in and look at the service archives, you'll see sometimes we'll stay with stocks for two, maybe three years on these big winners. We've been in CNX since February. So what's that? Six months. So that's been two earnings periods. Now, will we survive the next earning period? I don't know. Okay. Uh, many years ago, I think you said as a trader, you must make up your mind to either hold through all earnings or get out before the earnings and don't pick and choose, which I think is good advice. Yeah, that's what I said uh, years ago. Uh, personally, I think you should just hold on and not try to – and not try to um, – sharpshoot the earnings or whatever you want to call it uh, decide on when you're going to stay and when you're not but yeah uh as a general statement you have to take an all or none approach i prefer an all approach hold through all earnings because as a trend follower you're never going to get anywhere if you quit okay you don't you don't win by not losing you win by winning and that's something you might want to write down so Avoiding earnings is a not losing strategy. It's not a winning strategy. Now, if what you're doing has a bit of a if you're if you're making limited gains, if you're a pure swing trader and you're only staying in for a few days and your maximum gain is limited, then holding through earnings is probably a stupid thing to do. So that's where you would have to take the all or none approach. You would have to take the none approach, actually, because sooner or later you're going to get whacked. And if you have a short-term system where you're not making enough money, you can't survive getting whacked. But Dave, won't you get whacked? Yes. But if we're holding a position for a year and in the end it ends pretty badly, okay, I said it ends badly, right, a few minutes ago? But if it ends pretty badly, well, guess what? We probably still made a pretty good profit over the last year. It, 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 I mean, it could happen, but chances of it giving up a year's worth of gains are, are not likely. But if you're short-term trading and you're making, let's say you're making this much on every trade, if I can get this thing to work. Let's say you're making this much on every trade, okay? And you do that five times in a row, so you got about that much, okay? And then the earnings come out and you lose this much, then you're back to chip it away at it. It might take you five trades, 10 trades, 20 trades to get back to it, okay? But if you are a trade following and you took a small profit out and you're down the road, you're way down here, and you've made this much and the market drops that much, it's going to suck, Okay. You're going to drop an F-bomb, but guess what? You live. You will live to fight another day. And any time we've had a big trade in the end that's lost a lot of money, but net-net, they've still made a lot of money, okay? Let's say they made 80% of the trade and gave up 20% in one day at the end, okay? <laughs> I tell them, send me the money. Keep enough money out for a massage. Go get your little massage, center yourself, and completely forget about that trade. In 20-something years of my public life of doing this, I have never gotten a check in the mailbox from someone. So, yeah, it's going to end badly. Regarding IPOs, would you consider adding to position secondary setups? Absolutely. 
uh, pi right now. We're along pi, and pi, P-I, we talked about it last week, pi, is um, now set up again for a secondary setup. This is, I don't want to go digress too far, but the um, what he's alluding to is uh, swing trading around a position. So let's keep the math easy. Let's say uh, 200 shares. Say you buy 200 shares and you flip out 100 minus 100, okay? And then stock sets up again. You buy 100 shares, okay? And then you flip out 100 and rinse and repeat. This doesn't happen that often, but every now and then you'll get a stock that just makes this beautiful stair step higher. And you could swing trade around that core position. Now, I don't actually... In my trading service, I don't actually say, okay, we're going to put half back on, take half back off, take, put half back on, take half back off, because that could be a possible nightmare, okay? But what I do is when something sets up again, I'm like, guys, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, it's setting up again for an add-on trade, because I don't want to have to try to manage that add-on trade for everyone, but I want to teach you how to, how to do that on your own, you know, give a man a fish. He eats for a day, teach a man how to fish. He sits in a boat and drinks beer all day. Um, but I digress. You're welcome, David. Trade through all or not all. How's that, LOL? <laughs> trade through all earnings or don't trade through all. I don't know. What, it, what did I say? Um, I trade through all earnings, but... You have to take an all or none approach. Are you going to get out before every earnings or are you going to stay in before every earnings? Because if you pick and choose, that's the perverse thing about markets. Whenever you pick and choose, whenever you, as I often say, whenever you sharpshoot, okay? When you sharpshoot signals, guess what? You're going to get the two crappy signals or the 10 crappy signals and miss the one or two good signals, okay? Same thing is going to happen if you get out. I'm sorry. Yeah, if you pick and choose which earnings you trade through, you're going to get whacked sometimes. And then the big surprise is you're going to get out right before. And that's the weird, that's the frustrating thing about markets is they will do what they have to do to frustrate the most. Okay, Donald, who was talking about quantitative systems, says, uh, your biggest drawdown is a deed in front of you. Been there, done that. Well, good. Okay, so I can't pick on you for being a mechanical system, trader. If you realize what you're dealing with, if you realize that, hey, I'm doing this system and it's in perfect hindsight and then in for, and then in the future, it might not work quite as well, but I'm willing to live with that then by all means. Fantastic. I have become more discretionary over the years, but I still lean towards mechanical strategies. Well, Donald, that's the point I'm making is that and that's why my mechanical friends tell me just the opposite. but a lot of the successful mechanical traders that I know have put a layer of discretion on top of it, okay? Um, Rob Hanna, for instance, uh, he's a mechanical guy out there, but he won't necessarily take, like if the market is in a rip-roaring uptrend, he won't necessarily take the sell signals. So he, he quantifies it, but then he wraps a little discretion around what he's quantified. And I think that, I think that's the only way you can be successful much longer term in the markets. You have to put a little discretion on things. But, yeah, I mean, well, see, Donald, you might – I don't know where you are in your process, but he might be he might be where I was a while back. Well, geez, I hate to admit how long that goes. It was two decades ago, I guess, when all I did was program mechanical systems, and that's what made me a discretionary trader. So it's kind of like I've been there, done there, got done that, got the T-shirt. Now, um, doesn't mean you know some people do that and then they 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 always stay in that kind of realm. And as a mechanical person, there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, it was it was the the epiphany that got me from or, or got me to being a discretionary trader. <laughs> oh, you got some good uh, David and Goliath images. Okay. Hmm. Phil says, would you tell them to buy Google, Facebook? Yeah, well, see, that's the thing. Is like, would you – yeah, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't uh, – yeah, obviously, you could go back and say, uh, without the obvious, like buy this certain stock because it would go up a 1,000%. 
but maybe teach them the systems that would put you know if that was a caveat you could go back in time and say anything but you could you could talk about any particular stock then yeah you would say um, here's the systems and following the systems might just put you in some of these stocks certainly following the trend will put you in the stocks if they're going higher Gary says in 1987 on his date was a high in the Dow Jones before the crash in October well, okay, that's fine, uh, and, and you know what? We might crash in October, too. Uh, Octobers are usually pretty crazy, as you know. The thing is, you've got to be really careful. I don't know if you're alluding to an analog, a so-called analog, but you've got to be really careful uh, when you do that type of analysis, and I see a lot of people do it. And it's kind of fascinating, but you have to remember, and you have to ask yourself, self, is this entertaining and um, academic, or can I actually trade off of this? And if you can't trade off of it, then you need to toss it out, okay? Now, I know he who ignores the past is damned to repeat it, but I can promise you that it's going to unfold differently in the future. So let me see if I can give an example of a, of a possible analog. And you could have a lot of fun with analogs. You really can. But they're very, very, very dangerous. Uh, let's see. You said Dow Jones. Okay. And you said 19. Let's take a look at a weekly chart, see if we can get back there real quick. And then we'll, uh, you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, you can do so now. I'm going to jump into the overall markets, and then we'll cover individual stocks. So I don't know if I could do this on the fly, so you might just have to use your mind's eye on these things. But going back to 1987, he's saying that right around this time, we had the, the high. Let's see if we can grab that on a weekly basis just for s and g's bear with me let's see if we can do this so let's grab this 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 crash here okay now let's see if i could pull it up and see what happens. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. So here it is, and that's what that looks like. And I don't know if we could see if we can get it on this chart. And I don't know what that's looking like on your screen. Let's see what it looks like on your screen. Yeah, it should show up here. So let's go back. Let me pull this over here. Let's go back to today's date. Okay, so with an analog, you could take the past and you overlay it in the future, okay? And that's a pretty dangerous thing to do, okay? So you think, oh, well, look at that. If we overlay this, what do we have, okay? You see how that works? You see, see how the markets went up and kind of worked its way higher? In, in fact, at the same time, around the same time this year, let's put that on here, and oh, lo and behold, look at that. So it looks just like it looks back then, and then what happened? Bam, it crashed. Now, and my apologies to anyone who thinks otherwise, but they're wrong. I mean, it's not my way or highway. But can you really trade off of that? No, no, because the future is going to unfold differently. OK, that's an analog is almost like a mechanical system that's curve fit. If you think about it. Oh, the market topped in uh, August and, and went up, blah, blah, blah. And look, if you overlay it to today, it looks perfect. So the market's going to crash in October. It might. OK, but it's not going to be because of that. It might be coincidental at best. So be careful with that kind of stuff because that, that is pure curve fitting when you're doing that kind of stuff. So be careful.
All right, we'll get we'll get back to that. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that, John. One second. All right, let me just show you a couple things I really want to point out to you real quick. Uh, obviously, let's start with the overall market first and work our way down. Keep the stock picks coming. We're kind of going sideways, obviously, in here, and we had a bit of a knockout move um, yesterday. And today we're kind of recovering. Seems like every time this market sells off, it comes back. And you have to kind of get a feel for what type of market you're in. Yes, we're going sideways. And yeah, there's some sellers out there. But every time it sells off, it's like there's some mystery buyer that comes in. Now, I know some people out there who are a lot smarter than me. And I've met through doing webinars and all. And they're doing all this. They're watching these huge order flows and all kinds of stuff to try to identify the mystery buyers and figure out what's going on. Well, I, that's a little dangerous to do because the next mystery buyer is going to be that, just a mystery. It'll be coming out of God knows where. But all that looking at current volume does is show you what's going on now, and you don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's kind of like, you know, one thing I wanted to say before, I don't want to digress too far, but one thing I wanted to say when we talk about the earnings is, it's usually not the thing you know that's going to kill you. It's the thing you don't know. Okay, what's it? What's this? How's that saying go? It's not what you know. Uh, I forget how it goes. And then there's the, the the quote, the Mark Twain thing that was in um, what movie was that? Anyway, I digress. But yeah, it's not what you know. It's what you don't know in the market. So something out of the blue will likely whack you long before something you know is going to happen. That's why you don't try to micromanage yourself out of positions because the market will take off without you. And there's always going to be a reason to exit a trade. Anyway, P sold off fairly hard. I think what could happen here is we could see a fake out below this range and then the market could take off from there. Now, on a micro level, we saw that recently. Remember, I talked about this volatility fake out in here. And also a pattern in and of itself. You wait for a base, you wait for a fake out out of the base, and then you take the trade the opposite direction. Shorter term, that'll work out. I wouldn't rush out and trade that strategy, but it is a nice little arrow to have in your quiver. But we did have a bit of a sell-off yesterday, and then we're kind of flat filled today. So for the most part, before I outthink it too much, let's just draw our lines and arrows in here. We're kind of Flatsville, but Flatsville is okay because this 2175-ish area has the potential to become the new norm, okay? And the longer we could base it here, the longer that's going to be perceived as a value zone. Now, again, you know me as I preach ad nauseum. I would have much preferred if we would cleared this prior range much more decisively before coming back in because if we sell off too hard, we're back into this longer-term God awful sideways soup, okay? Which we've been in forever, seems like. So I, I'm not like raging bull or anything, but so far, so good. The market's hanging in there. As a trend follower, I am not, repeat, I am not going to argue with a market that's not too far from all time highs and just kind of hanging in there, okay? Air on the side of the trend. Write that down, okay? Shorter term, trends a little sideways in here, and I, I admit that. But longer term, so far, the uptrend remains intact, and we're just shy of new highs. So, so far, so good on that. What you don't know that you don't know. What you don't know that you don't know. What you don't know that you don't know. Thank you, Heather. What you don't know that you don't know. I'm going to have to remember that one. What you don't know that you don't know. All right. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. Um, oh, as far as like the crash at October, I mean, I don't know. I mean, remember last summer, uh, I was really worried about this uh, bow tie down that we had because last 20, 30 years, that led to a bear market, okay? And it looked kind of iffy in here for a while, and I thought maybe with the Brexit deal, it was going to we'll get that final rollover. And again, markets will do sort of some uh, – Obvious things in an obvious manner. In this particular case, maybe bigger picture-wise, this would be the final top, okay? It looked like it was a top here, but no, it's going to top over here. But as a trend follower, let's not think too much. Let's not try to outsmart it. Let's just wait. But, yeah, these moving averages are losing a little steam in here. So this market needs to get going 
at some point, right? Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ got a little shorter term in the sideways range. Sold off fairly hard yesterday, but kind of stabilizing today. That's one thing that always amazes me in markets is you have a big day, and it seems like the end of the world, and the next day it's just kind of a shoulder shrug. And that happens over and over and over again. So don't get too caught up in one day's bar. And I know the media has to talk about something. I try to avoid the news as much as possible. But I will get a little bit through osmosis, sometimes turn the radio on or whatever. And they make it sound like the end of the world. Well, it's like, eh, you know, it was a NASDAQ down yesterday, half a percent. It's not the end of the world, okay? It happens. Let's see what it was down. I'm curious. Oh, 0.81%. Now, the Rusty was also down 0.81%. I know that. And the reason I know that is because the prior day it was up 0.75%. So it gave up all of those gains and then some. But as a general statement, it has worked its way higher. Now, you know me. This market kind of took off and then it kind of just drifted sideways in here. I would much rather a market accelerate higher as opposed to losing momentum. But... You can't always get what you want, okay? And so far, it's pushed into this overhead supply. Now, for me to get excited about this market, I'd like to see it just bust through this overhead supply and not look back. Now, gold and silver, which I was going to talk quite a bit about. Let's take a look at those guys. Gold got whacked pretty hard yesterday, okay? Now, it's at, it's at an inflection point on the daily chart. Let's put in a bow tie to see what's going on. Yeah, look at that. You almost have a bow tie down on a daily chart. It's not off of all-time highs, so it's not as crucial if it was off of all-time highs, but it's off a of multi-year high, so it's significant enough, okay? But if you back the chart out a little bit to gain some perspective, so far this trend from lows, this pretty serious trend from lows remains intact, and so far this is just a knockout move. Not that I trade off the weekly, but it's good to look at the weekly chart to gain a little perspective. So on a daily chart, we are at a bit of an inflection point. The great thing about going after trades when you're at an inflection point like this, and silver is even cleaner. So let's take a look at silver. Much, much cleaner chart in silver, okay, which is odd because <laughs> anybody anybody that ever trade silver futures, oh, my God, it's like beating, a head, beating your head against the wall. It feels so good when you stop, you know. It, they're just crazy. The only thing that's worse than that, I, I would say, is probably cocoa. I don't know if anybody's ever traded cocoa, but that's, you know, uh, that'll make you even more crazier. But what's weird is silver's actually uh, cleaner than uh, the gold stocks. So what's SLV doing, SLV, real quick? You know, SLV, yeah, you can see pretty serious pullback here. Uh, in general, a little bit cleaner than gold, but let's go back to the gold, uh, silver stocks. And silver stocks obviously follow the underlying commodity. There is some correlation there. I'm sure it diverges and, and does weird things in between. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The last webinar that I hosted for uh, someone else for the expert panel, the time and research stuff, uh, somebody had some very convincing arguments why these gold and silver stocks would tank, and, and they so far they've tanked. Uh, my only problem with that is 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 that you could, there's always going to be a reason for things to happen, and sometimes they will work. And you just gotta remember that it's not always going to work that way because, and as I said in the webinar, and, and so far this guy's right, but I think it's dangerous type of analysis because, as Keynes once said, markets can stay irrational a lot longer than you can stay solvent. So – be careful with that type of macro an, uh, analysis as to why something should unfold. Keep it in your mind, but what is, is. Okay, make sure you have some sort of technical analysis type of trigger, some sort of trigger on the charts, if that's the analysis you're going to follow. Anyway, silver looks pretty good. It looks even better than gold, at least in the gold stock. I'm sorry, the silver stocks. Uh, nice persistent move higher in a weekly. And so far, it doesn't even look like that much of a knockout. Okay, you gain, let me uh, clean this chart up. You gain a little bit more perspective here. So the question that um, Jim was asking is, I've been trailing my stop higher on GDX and was within 50 cents of being taken out. Let's take a look at GDX. That's a gold miners. Okay. 
yesterday. Now, one thing I want to point out here, just to give you a little extra lesson. Yesterday, this stock, which is an ETF, sold off really hard. It closed on its ass, okay, down here towards its lows to close on its buttocks. And let's say you had a stop somewhere in here, and he said he was within 50 cents of a stop. So when a market gets impl implodes like this and you're not quite stopped out, just be careful the next day because there's a better than average chance you're going to get knocked down in the open. But that market might be so sold out that you get that reversion to the mean move shortly thereafter. Easy for me to say. So he says he's been trailing to stop higher in GDX and was within 50 cents of being taken out yesterday. He's been looking to add another precious metal position. Looks like a TKO in several of the metal stocks, but sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between a longish pullback and a TKO in the first thrust down. I guess if it turns out to be the first thrust down, correctly placed buys will never trigger. Yes, he answered his own question. Okay. Might be a little bit easier to see on, on the weekly chart and the underlying commodity. So he's saying that he doesn't know if it's just a deep pullback or the beginning of something bigger. I don't know either. But if you have an entry up here, then if it is a bona fide reversal, then, then yeah, then you get triggered in. If it is, I'm sorry, if it is a bona fide top, then you don't get triggered. The market just continues to implode. If it is a bona fide reversal back in the direction of the trend, in other words, if it's a trend resumption, then you get triggered in. So he answered his own question on that one. Uh, just a couple other sectors to look at real quick, and then we'll get to your individual stock questions. Some of these areas like uh, Internet, just kind of pulling back in here. Most areas at or near new highs like the overall market. Drugs got whacked yesterday, and that's a bit of a bummer because they're pulling back into their prior little range in here. But for the most part, as a general statement, most areas still look pretty good like the overall market. So I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, bail out on everything just because drugs are not looking so hot. A couple of the areas in here looking questionable. Uh, I will honor my stops just in case. And I will certainly wait for entries on the areas that corrected really hard, such as the goals. OK. Yeah, coffee's coffee's pretty bad, too. But coffee with coffee trends, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and that's the boy. That's that's the one that. You know, that's a good way to learn how to trade is, is go in and trade something like coffee where you just you just lose and lose and lose and lose and then you get frustrated to give up and then you have the mother of unbelievable uh, uh, all uh, uptrends, you know. <laughs> now, uh, no, cocoa's worse than coffee because cocoa's choppy. Coffee could trend like a mofo, but in the meantime, you're going to lose your buttocks. Okay. Donald says, I've been trading for nearly 30 years. The first few years were very lucrative, turned south after initial success. That's that's very familiar, Donald. That's that's what most, most of us. And I struggled for a decade or more, nearly wiped out in the 7-8 bear market. Well, the 7-8 bear market should have wiped you out if you're a trend follower. Okay, I'm not beating you up uh, because it sounds like you're, you're, you're coming along here. But he said he had initial success, and then it took him 10 years to get back to that success. And that's typical. And, and the problem is with that initial success is you end up with a permanent income hypothesis. And I was talking about this yesterday in, in the webinar that I was um, a guest in. People who come into service when I'm printing money, they end up with a permanent income hypothesis. I'm like, they're like, I'm going to quit my job. Why am I working so hard in my job when I could just like trade 10 minutes a day and go off and play golf, or sit on my boat or whatever? It's like, well, it's not always this easy. OK. And a lot of times those same people, when things begin to get a little choppy and we hit the inevitable drawdown, they quit and they go search for the next Holy Grail and they end up perpetually out of phase. And sometimes they come back to me 10 years later and then those become my best longer term clients. Um, so that's very typical. You have initial success and then you spend the next 10 years trying to figure out what you did to get that initial success. And it might just have been the markets. Okay. Now, if you are a trend follower, 2007, 2008, I don't, I don't want to put any, I don't want one cup of coffee next webinar, Dave. I don't want to pour any salt in your wounds, but as a trend follower, you should not have been fighting the market that long. 
and you should have you should have had a stop in place. So I you know I can't pick on you without knowing you did or what you didn't do. After that brutal experience, I learned some new methodologies that continue to do so and have been successful since. Well, be careful with the – there's a few people, and I don't throw anybody under the bus, but I have some peers that will occasionally call me, and it sounds to me like they're still searching. It's kind of like, why are you calling me to ask me about this? Haven't you developed something over the last 20 years? You know, so be careful. You know, it's it's Okay. And if they're calling me because they're just they always want to keep learning, that's fine. That's one thing. But I get the sense, at least in certain particular cases, where they're still searching. OK. So that's where you got to be really careful if you're still searching. Do do research. Don't search. Ooh, write that down. Do research. Don't search. OK. Find something. Find something simple. Stick with it. And continue to do research, but just don't search. Martin Gale's strategies almost wiped me out in the bear market. Seven, eight, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Martin Gale's strategies will work until they don't. You know, go to. Uh, that's why there's limits on tables in Vegas. Okay, like a roulette table. Just double down every time you lose, and then you eventually you win, right? Well. There's two caveats. One, you don't run out of money. And in the case of a casino, they're worried that you might not run out of money if you have deep pockets and you're really a crazy, crazy gambler. So they put a limit on the table, and that stops that Martin Gale from working. But, yeah, a lot of that Martin Gale stuff will work. Doubling down will work until it don't. you got to be really careful. Just what Rumsfeld said. What did Rumsfeld say? I know you don't pay attention to news, but I wonder whether we could be stuck until after the election. Not that you or I could predict. Just a thought. Yeah, Carol, that's that's one of the things. And I know a lot of people are doing a lot of that. Um, I don't want to call it analogs, but they're doing a lot of research, going back and looking at what happens in prior elections. And, we could we could be in a bit of a holding pattern, and you know what? It's not going to make any difference, and that's a weird thing. It's not going to make any difference. Uh, you would think that the that the market does better under Republicans, but it actually does better under Democrats. Okay, but that I don't think there's any positive correlation there. I just think that the Democrats tend to be on a good cycle of things. I think things are things that get kind of crappy, and then Republicans come in. <laughs> I'm sorry, things are doing well, then the Republicans come in and things get crappy, and I think they're just on a bad cycle. But, yeah, I don't want to get into that too much. But you might be right. That could be what's holding the market uh, in a range. Sure. John says, recent F-bomb, YRD sold half at 31, bought at 25. Let's remain to ride. Where would you place your stop? YRD, I actually thought about that one as a potential setup coming into today. But the reason I didn't go after it is because I got to looking at it, and uh, it's got a bad tick in here. I don't know if I can make it work without the tick. But it at first, it looked like a deep pullback. Let's see if we can go back one day. At first, it just looked like a deep pullback to me. But then when I looked at it, it's like this was at 40-something a share, and now it's at 25 a share. And look at this HV, 113. And that's that's a lot for a stock that's at $25 a share. And the, what I'm, why I'm saying that is like these low price stocks can have some really volatile moves and they're still tradable. But when you see something in $20, $30, $40 a share has an HV that big, that's, you know, that's a big red flag that goes up and says, okay, I know Big Dave says trade volatile stocks, but this is just plain stupid. This is just plain ridiculous. So I would not take this on as a new trade, okay? So the question is, let the remainder ride. Where would you place stops? Well, uh, well, you're asking me, you're asking me to make a plan after the fact. Now, I'm not saying this to beat you up, John. I'm saying this as a, as a teachable moment for everyone else. Okay, so don't make a plan after the fact. Make a plan before. So when, and I don't have a better way of putting it, but other than, and my apologies to you ladies in here. We're getting more and more ladies, so I guess I better watch it. But when the shit hits the fan, which it will quite often, okay, 
if anybody ever see airplane where the, literally that actually happened, it was pretty interesting, pretty funny. Um, I digress. But when it hits the fan, you need to be ready for it and have a plan in place, okay? So uh, if you're still long, I don't know, it really shouldn't, it really shouldn't drop much further than it already is. Uh, it shouldn't drop below 20 because if it got below that, it really is truly reversal. But at this point in time, it's looking pretty ugly. So I would, especially with today's action and all, even though it reversed a little bit, it's just too too crazy. So avoid that one. So yeah, I mean, if you're still long, if it drops below 20, get out. You know, the problem is you have an existing position in place with the existing parameters. So now you're thinking in the back of your head, well, I would lose so much and boy, I hate to lose. And, you know, now it becomes really complex. Whereas if you had the plan going in, you just you just kind of accept it. You accept it going in. And that's why I often say I kind of went through this this process where it's like, why do people why don't why do people not trade? Boy, I'm all twisted up today. Why do people fail to plan their trades? And the reason they fail to plan is the moment you put a plan in place is the moment that you admit that you could be wrong. OK, and that's why people don't typically plan their trades. So next time I have a plan going in. AG for Phil, uh, a little too deep on the pullback for my taste. Um, that's a little extreme. And, you know, I've been saying these goals and silvers, boy, we need some deep pullbacks. And then it's like, be careful what you wish for. Now it's a little bit too much. Okay. So if anything, I think that one could be at an inflection point. So I would avoid that. RJ wants to know about Rita. No. Well, it's kind of crazy. It shot up, came back in. No, um, it would actually have to break out to, to at least mark. It's a fairly new issue. So I think it had to get above the 20s before I would reconsider it as a setup. Uh, right now, it's just a little too, uh, too wide and loose and crazy in that case. Now, there are some cases where you might say, hey, Dave, didn't you recommend an IPO look like that? Well, usually what will happen is these will actually bottom out nicely and then this – uh, trading is further in the past, okay? The overhead supply, are bad memories. There are known knowns. These are the things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. <laughs> there are things we don't know we don't know. Donald Rumsfeld. Oh, okay. Things we don't know we don't know. Yeah, it's not what you what you know that that's gonna hurt you usually. ACIA, that's one that's getting a little crazy. That was one that we were, you know, where's the with the boy perfect Covell, right? We were long, believe it or not, and you can look at the archives of delayed service. We were long right there. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> Bouncing Bronco, huh? Bucking Bronco. Um, I think this one's gotten a little too crazy to go after now. I mean, look at the HV 107. And look at the price, 100 bucks a share. I hear you, though. It's not a bad-looking chart, but I just think it's too dangerous. It, it would actually have to have a little bit deeper pullback, I think, based on the magnitude of the move, and that would, just, that would make it even more crazier. So at first glance, it looks like a pretty good-looking setup, but based on the magnitude of the move, based on the HV, it's just too crazy at this juncture. If I didn't have this right here, this HV, on the chart and I didn't have this scaling over here, then I would say, yeah, it looks like a pretty good chart, maybe even a little bit deeper pullback. So good eye, good eye, but um, way too crazy now. Things we don't, things we know that are wrong. Clinton, can you rephrase that? You have something, is there a few words missing in that sentence, Phil? <laughs> KLDX. Oh, Phil, I may need to talk to you about uh, a European broker, so uh, keep an eye on. I'll send you an email if I need that. Um, yeah, this looks pretty good. This is the metals and mining. I would actually like a little bit deeper pullback uh, in this one, John. But yeah, good eye on that. That looks pretty good, but a little bit deeper pullback. Nice little base, nice little base breakout, nice little uptrend. Yeah, keep it on your list for sure. What is HV? HV is historical volatility. It's also known as statistical volatility, and I have it up here 
Uh, I keep it on all my charts. If you want the formula, this is a 50-day HV. Uh, I'll be happy to give it to you. Um, I didn't program it myself. I found the program on the um, found the, the uh, formula on the internet, and then somebody actually reduced it down further for me. Uh, it's a it's a log. I'm going to show you my ignorance in math here. Um, it's a log. It's a day over day logarithmic change, and then it annualizes out over one year. So let me explain that in terms of a bell curve. And again, I'm going to show my ignorance of statistics. So this is 49. It's a percentage. So there's a two-thirds chance, which is that big part of the bell curve, the big fat part of the bell curve, that this particular stock is going to be 49% higher or 49% lower annualized a year from now. Okay. Now, remember that statistics are worthless. 74.3% of all people know that. So be very careful when working with these statistics. And it also assumes a normal distribution, and markets are not normally distributed. If markets were normally distributed, then statisticians, statisticians would own the markets, and they don't. So it's just a measurement, and it's a standardized measurement. It's also it's how I measure beta. So we know this stock has an HV of 49. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at the S&P 500. S&P 500 has an HV of 13. So that's roughly, what, three and a half times? Let's see. On the fly, 3.7 times more volatile. So that particular stock is three times, 3.7 times more volatile than the overall market. And by the way, you will not beat a market in spite of what some people say. I disagree with them. I know it's not my way or highway. But it's very hard to beat a market with stocks that are less volatile than the overall market as a general statement. And then read the article, Better the Devil You Know, on my website. That's a long-winded answer in HV. Things we don't know that we don't know. Trump, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to go in that hole. Uh, light, L-I-T-E. Yeah, this looks good. Uh, needs a little bit more pullback. Nice uh, nice uptrend in here, but it needs a little bit more pullback. Okay. Of course, the reverse of that is that volatile stocks can whack you more as well. Right, Kent. Fully, fully agree. Fully, fully, fully agree. But if you go in and watch the YouTubes where I talk about trading more volatile stocks, they're actually less risky because you're trading fewer shares, okay? If you're trading a less volatile stock, you're going to have to put in more shares to catch catch a move because it's not going to move as much. I, I, I did a, several presentations on that. So, yeah, check that out on my YouTube channel. I have a great answer for you. Is PVG meeting your criteria? Yeah, PVG we just technically got stopped out on today. That's what I was talking about. But what did the market do? It turned right back around. Uh, I would not take this as a brand new setup to my clients that use a little discretion and stayed with it. I would say stay with it. Uh, you know, don't throw caution to the wind. If it takes out nine or, or today's low even, then by all means, get the F out. OK, um, drop the F bomb, bomb, then get the F out. But, yeah, it, it's it looks like a big fake out move, but I would not trade it as a brand new setup. TWLO. TWLO. Yeah, this looks pretty good. It needs a needs a little bit deeper pullback. It is starting to get a little crazy in here. It is on my watch list. Maybe a tiny bit more pullback. I like the way it faked up to the upside that came back in. Um, you know, use the propensity that markets often fake out to your advantage and will often do the obvious and unobvious manner. That's frustrating once you're in a trade or if you got sucked into a losing trade. But it's actually something you could use as part of your strategy, and it actually helps things work. So that's a good thing. How does the weekly bow tie look on XAU? XAU. I don't know if I have that one. Uh, I have another version of it. What's it called? XAU. Is it dollar sign XAU? There it is. Uh, weekly bow tie. Let's take a look at that. 
Well, yeah, the weekly bow tie was 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 back here. So yeah, that would still be long on a weekly bow tie basis. And you know, here's the beauty of something like a weekly bow tie, especially off of major highs and major lows. You'd have been short right here, okay, and then you'd be long right here, okay. So you know, I was picking on um, who was I picking on earlier? I already forgotten uh, Donald about staying staying long doing a bear market. Well. As you can see, not that it's always going to work this great, but you have simple systems like following a weekly bow tie would have kept you on the right side of this market. Now, it would have been kind of a wild and crazy ride, but you'd have rode that whole thing all the way down, and you'd be long for quite a while here. So, But, yeah, the weekly bow tie, that was a while back on that one. Andre says, study shows that 95% of traders can beat SPX. Should I just trade a SPY? I can't trade it. No, why would you do that? No. Uh, I don't know, about 95%. I'd say 95% of all mutual fund managers can't beat it. Why? Because they just follow it down, or not follow it down, they stay long. They stay long all the time. But no, don't, you see, trading an efficient market, especially like the S&P 500, is very difficult. And buy and hold will work until it don't, okay? And quite often throughout history, there's some pretty big spills in here. You know, it was at, uh, well, that's more than 50%. It was much more than 50%. Take a look at like the NASDAQ was 80%, which was this move here. So 50% move, so you could lose half your money every now and then. Yeah, oh, it looks great on paper. But those metrics of buy and hold are based on an 81-year time horizon. I learned that from Greg Morris. And as Sweet Brown once said, ain't nobody got time for that. DLR has really started to pick up steam, a bad sign. DLR? Uh, you mean the dollar or DLR? I'm not sure what you're talking about. TCMD, if trend resumes, let's take a look at that. Yeah, AJ, I'm, I'm, I, that stock that you're asking about is on my list. So I can't talk about it. Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting in here. Uh, this is where I would almost – the volume's a little bit low, but I would actually apply a breakout strategy on this one. And, and I know I don't talk much about talk, break, trading breakouts because I don't do it except in rare cases in IPOs. But if you have the IPO course, I would, I would exercise – I would use that breakout strategy, LC. LC. And if you don't have it, why not? All right, LC. Okay. Um, now, this one has too much uh, overhead supply to deal with. I know it'd be a good problem to have if you made a 40% or 30% on it, but too much. Okay, Sam wants to know about MIME. Reminds me of those Miami things. Um, Mimecast, I don't know mimes are that popular. Well, it's certainly trending, but it would have to accelerate higher because you had this one wide range bar and then just kind of drifted in here. It would have to accelerate higher and then maybe look to trade pullbacks along the way. About short, DLR has not picked up steam. Uh, yeah, Jim, same, same stock as AJ, I think. So can't look at that one. AXU for Andre. Uh, yeah, this looks, looks okay. Let's take a look at this. Um, my only concern with some of these metals in mining is is they have pulled back below their prior little, as I talked about. If you don't have the stock selection course, look at the, uh, the video on the page under my store. There's a free video on the page. Watch that. My concern here is that it pulled back below its prior little peak in here. So it's pulled back. You get a pullback. And then a thrust, okay, and then you get a pullback below that prior thrust. So that's what's going on there, pullback below this prior peak into the prior pullback. But when you back the chart out sometimes, you can see that the magnitude of the move is so significant, then the pullback, it, you could kind of weigh that against that. But that's my only concern there is a pullback is the prior pullback. So it looks okay. I think you could probably do better in the metals and mining. 
Uh, that AJ, you're on my list, buddy. I like that one too. That's on my list. <laughs> Actually, I could show you that one because it's not. It has. It's not on for today's list. Uh, this will be on my list soon. This is beat. Good eye, AJ. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it now. I do. What's gonna be on my list tonight? <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> Looks great. Uh, let's see who else. Somebody we hadn't gotten to yet. Kent, we got you. Oh, you're welcome, Kent. Uh, yeah, AJ, all those little silver stocks are on my list too. LEDs. No, it's all over the place. Who who asked me about that? I have to uh, shame you. You know better than that. I'm not gonna call your name out. Your pockets are almost not deep enough. Oh goodness. Yeah, Margell stock will really uh, hurt you badly. Okay, light and round here. We got time for just a couple of more. Light? Did we talk about light? Yeah, we talked about light. Yeah, it could it could set up soon. Seco, I'm probably not gonna like. And the reason I'm not gonna like it just as a blanket statement, and I guess you can't get too biased when it comes to markets, but educational stocks tend to be wide and loose. Um, notice longer term, just kind of looks like electrocardiogram. It's all over the place. But personalities can change. So um, for me to get excited about this one, it would actually have to break out to new highs and then pull back. But it's certainly in a trend. It certainly looks okay. Um, if you were long this stock, then stay, stay long. You're in longer-term trend-following mode, maybe like a 50-day moving average or something. Let's just put that in there for S&Gs and see what happens. would probably keep you long. Let's see. It's 50. Yeah. So you just stay long. It's trending. If you look at precious metal stocks on last runs, they kept undercutting prior lows when they kept going then the, ent the entire move. Yeah, they did. I hear what you're saying because they did, they did, they never really uh, took out, they never really had a real correction until now. I hear you on that. Sam says, thanks so much, Dave. The statement that you should set yourself up for limited losses and limited gains is already making a difference for me. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, last one, OCN. Uh, no, too much overhead supply in that one. We'll do one more. Yeah, this one's kind of a little crazy. Look at the HV on this, 139. That's uh, a little bit too crazy, even by my standards, as far as liking these uh, more volatile stocks. So a little too crazy. I hear you, though. though. It's taken off. Looks like it wants to go straight up. Um I would not trade it, but if you did trade it, it would have to have a deeper pullback to correct some of this move. Oh, you're welcome, Don. Well, look, uh, we're way out of time. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled uh, by your presence. Uh, any questions, uh, daviddavelandry.com. If it's a question that requires a lot of thought, I'll just make it fodder for next week's show and answer it then. Uh, if we don't talk to you now on the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend. I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.